In 1883, Green Lake Township, in which Interlochen is located, was organized. Lumbermen flocked to the area for the abundant, towering white pine timber, much of which was used to help rebuild Chicago after the Great Fire. Many traveled by rail, and at the intersection of the two railroads was an interlocking switch. Accordingly, the nearby town was called Interlochen. The other main transportation was steamships or tugs which cruised the nearby Betsy River, Duck Lake, and Green Lake. In the early days, local folks met at the town watering pump. Children walked to the Little Red Schoolhouse, and many of their parents worked at the nearby Wiley Cooperage Mill, making barrels. In 1927, the musical missionary Dr. Joe Maddy sought a permanent home for his dream of a full-size symphony orchestra composed entirely of school children. His creation, the National High School Orchestra Camp, was to make the little town world famous. Music greats like John Philip Sousa and Howard Hansen played homage to the camp and before long its students were in great demand at world fairs and leading concert halls across the nation. In 1962, a year-round private fine arts boarding high school was established, fulfilling Dr. Joe Maddy's dream. There has been many world-famous artists that have graduated from this prestigious institution. Today's visitors to Interlochen can still see some of the original growth white pines over 400 years old at the nearby state park. Still standing on the Interlochen campus are the old Interlochen Hotel, the Interlochen Bowl, and the Little Red Schoolhouse. To learn more about the history of Interlochen and the surrounding towns, pick up a copy of the new publication, An Oral History of the Interlochen Area. There's a little town called Northport up in northern Michigan. 150 years ago is when the town began. When founded, it was just a little cove around the bend. Then people came from far and wide, its history then began. If you've ever looked at Michigan, it's shaped much like a hand. It's known throughout our nation as the winter wonderland. The tip of the little finger is where this town began. 150 years ago in northern Michigan For Northport, Michigan is where I long to be Northport, Michigan was always home to me Through my life I've traveled all about But I was raised in Northport and of that I'm very proud In the year of 1849 a little town was born Started with a mission, then a school, and then a farm. There's Swedish and there's English, Scotch and Irish too. There's Ottawa and Chippewa, just to name a few. Springtime in this little town, it's like a movie scene. The cherry blossoms all in bloom, the hillsides all in green. There's sailboats in the harbor, baby ducks in the mill pond. Farmers so intend their crops till the harvesting is done. For Northport, Michigan is where I long to be. Northport, Michigan was always home to me. Through my life I've traveled all about. But I was raised in Northport and of that I'm very proud. If you've ever been to Northport then you know just what I mean. People in this little town are living out a dream, a dream that all Americans have had a time or two. A little town, a little church, a little country school. The harvesting is over and it's autumn season now. The leaves and all the forest are shades of red and gold and brown. The beauty of creation is visible all around. And then he lays a blanket of white upon this little town. For Northport, Michigan is where I long to be. Northport, Michigan was always home to me. Through my life I've traveled all about. But I was raised in Northport and of that I'm very proud. 
It's through my life I've traveled far and wide. I envy those in North Port who have lived there all their lives. There's a little town called North Port up in northern Michigan. 150 years ago is when the town began. When founded, it was just a little cove around the bend. Then people came from far and wide, its history then began. If you've ever looked at Michigan, it's shaped much like a hand. It's known throughout our nation as the winter wonderland. The tip of the little finger is where this town began. 150 years ago in northern Michigan. For Northport, Michigan is where I long to be. Northport, Michigan to me. Through my life I've traveled all about. But I was raised in Northport and of that I'm very proud. I envy those in Northport who have lived there all their lives. What comes around, goes around. This 137-year-old China doll is proof. For the giver of this anonymous gift, over a half century later, became the receiver of the brotherly love this unique antique represents. It all started in Northport in 1862, when the eldest son of William Voice, owner of the local sawmill, prepared to heed President Lincoln's call for soldiers to fight for the Union Army in the Civil War. The recruits called themselves the Lakeshore Tigers. Young William's little sister, Abby, the youngest of the five voice children, seemed unusually afraid for her brother's safety. To quiet her crying, William promised to bring her back a China doll. Soon he departed downstate to Camp Jackson, where true to his little sister's premonition, he caught typhoid fever and died on September 22nd. Four days later, the steamer Buffalo returned his body in a metal casket. Fixed atop it was a small box with no card or note. It contained the head and shoulders of a China doll. Days, I guess, mostly you made the clothes or made the body and the clothes for the doll. You just bought the head and, and the rest you made yourself. The thoughtful women of Northport got together and completed the body and clothing for the doll. And on Christmas Eve at the log meeting house, it was presented to three-year-old Abby. She named the doll Jeanette and treasured it always. She would hold it, she'd let you touch it, but you, you didn't play with it because the china head, of course, if, a, if you dropped it, it would break and then you wouldn't have any doll. So as, as little girls, you. You and your friends couldn't play with it? No, no, we never even got to hold it. Grandma would hold it, you could touch it, but you couldn't hold it, because you might drop it. Over 60 years later, Abby had grown up, married, and moved to Traverse City, where she did hospice work. One day, she was helping a needy old soldier when he began to reflect upon his Civil War days and of a sick young man with him in a Jackson hospital. The dying man was delirious, begging anyone to buy him a China doll for his baby sister. Doctors and nurses ignored his raving, but the man had been touched. So he spent the last of his money on the head and shoulders of a China doll. He brought it to the bed of his sick comrade, who grew calm as he cradled the promised present. He died before morning. Abby later returned to the old soldier with Jeanette. I was that man's baby sister and here is the doll, she told him. The good turn had deserved another. Jeanette, now over 130 years old, was left by Grandma Abby to her namesake, Abby Morgan, who now lives in Lansing. I knew I was getting the doll, yes. I always knew I was getting the doll. Grandma always told me when she was gone that I would have the doll because I was named after her. My mother had told me that too. Anyway, it's, it's a real privilege and I, I really treasure her because it's, it's uh, 
Plus my grandmother's, and now it's mine. Well, everybody's real impressed. I think it touches almost everybody's heart, you know, because especially the part, like you say, after all those years, she finally found the gentleman that went and got the doll for her brother so that it could come home in the first place. Come visit Jeanette, now on display in Northport for their sesquicentennial celebration. She may be made out of china and cloth, but the hearts of those who handled her were pure gold. I'd say she's in good shape for 130. Approaching the turn of the century, Traverse City, better known as Queen City of the North, was a booming timber town, shipping mountains of prized white pine to Chicago. Our founding fathers traded with the local Ottawa and Chippewa tribes, which had been driven to Michigan from their ancestral homeland in eastern Canada by the fierce Iroquois. The first frame house in Grand Traverse County was built on the old Mission Peninsula in 1842 by missionary Peter Doherty. Reverend Doherty worked hard to convert the local natives to Christianity, but one local chief, however, refused when he was forbidden to smoke his pipe in the new church. An isolated TC was taken out of the wilderness in 1872 when the first railroad train pulled into town. The nearest station had been 150 miles away, and TC residents had referred to trips to Detroit or Chicago as going outside. In the late 1800s, the term theater held risque connotations. So in 1892, the new building was called the City Opera House. Its first performance, a melodrama called Avenged, was reviewed by the local paper as the vilest thing ever shown in this town. In its first five years, the Opera House hosted 45 plays, four operettas, 13 grand balls, 11 conventions, and a variety of concerts. After spending over 40 years in a cottage by the bay, the father of Traverse City, Perry Hanna, built his retirement dream house on 6th Street in 1891. The Victorian mansion contains 40 rooms, 10 fireplaces, some of the finest woodwork of the era, and a foyer featuring Tiffany cut glass windows. Prior to basketball star Dan Marley, Traverse City's most famous sports hero was baseball star Bundy Brief, whose real last name was spelled like this. When applying for work, he was told, that's too much, make it brief, which he did. Traverse City even named an ice cream treat after him, the Home Run Bundy, vanilla on a stick covered with chocolate. Bundy Brief played for the St. Louis Browns in 1912 and the Chicago White Sox in 1915 before settling back home to his beloved Traverse City. In the early years, potatoes, not cherries, were the main cash crop in this area. In fact, rural schools gave kids a week-long potato vacation to help parents with the harvest. By 1914, cherries had replaced apples as the most valuable crop, and by the early 20s, Traverse City's new nickname had become Cherry Capital of the World. On May 22, 1925, the first official Blessing of the Blossoms was held, with the very first Cherry Queen, Gertrude Brown, selected from a field of 72 contestants by having her name drawn from a hat. In 1928, the festival was moved to harvest time and called the Michigan Cherry Festival. In 1933, it was dubbed the National Cherry Festival and expanded to a three-day event. In 1965, the festival was enlarged to a week-long celebration, including numerous parades, events, and activities. <laughs> 